My name is Ekaterina Kulkova. Uh, I work as a plant-based nutritionist. So I work with people with uh, all sorts of health conditions. And um, in order uh, to be, you know, always on the top of my work, I study all the time. So uh, my, uh, the last half a year I was studying uh, neurological aspect of diet and I find it fascinating, so I want you to get into it a little bit more. Um, so, uh, the subject of the talk is how do we make our food choices? What makes us uh, go for this or not for this this time and why it changes? Um, so, about the animals. So, how do you think how animals make any kind of choices? How do they know how to when to hibernate, what to eat? How do they know? Any suggestions? Don't be shy. Like let's make it as a discussion. <laughs> instinct. Instinct. Yes. Good guess. And how do you think uh, animal feels the instinct? Like what does it say? Does he hear the voice in his head? You go and eat fish, or or how does he experience it? Follows his parents. Well, n not necessarily. Some. Yes. I mean, it is. It could be a part of education, but uh, some animals grow up without parents. How do they know? They're motivated by their instinct. Mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, clues, the, clues from the environment. Clues from the environment. Yeah. So they react on the situation. <coughs> okay, the situation is changes and they react on it somehow, but as we understand, for example, where he doesn't have a conscious plan to go and hibernate in October and now in July, in August, to eat a lot and fatten up. There is scientists not sure he has a, a conscious thought about it. So he just feels it. And what exactly he feels? He feels hunger. At certain periods of his life, he feels severe hunger because he needs to fatten up for the winter. And uh, the way how it works is called mechanism of animal behavior control. And uh, what is happening in reality, there is a situation, you probably can't see the slide, but anyway, I will, I will say. Uh, there is a situation in the environment, and the neurological system of the animal react on the situation according to genetic uh, information in his DNA, it's there, it's all written how he's supposed to react on this particular natural situation. So, uh, his uh, limbic system, which is part of the brain, uh, we call it reptilian brain for humans, it's more ancient part of the uh, brain. And uh, for humans, especially, we have a little bit in there called amygdala, and this little almond like piece of brain. Uh, responsible for our emotions, feelings, desires, and preferences, which for the animals we call instincts, but for us it's emotions, because we're a little bit biased. <laughs> so, amygdala and limbic system uh, give order to your um, endocrine system for hormonal release. And as soon as the particular hormone is in your blood, you, uh, it creates a feeling, you feel something. So anyone experienced uh, adrenaline rush? So you go, you cross in the street, and then car comes, and it happens in a split second, you feel this adrenaline and you run. Did you experience it? <laughs> yeah, this is uh, how quick it happened, how, like, how long it took. Exactly. It's, it's, uh, they calculated it, and it's a, a, a very fraction of a second, really, it happens. It happens very quick. So uh, as soon as your limbic system reacted, you have a feelings, you have emotions, and you have a response. And this motivates you uh, to particular action. And this is how bear knows that right now there is so much salmon here that he just gonna eat only the caviar and only the brains because this is the fattest bit of the uh, of the fish, so he can fatten up the quickest. And how he knows that this is the fattest? He didn't count the calories. He he doesn't know. It just tastes better to him at this particular moment. 
because he needs to fatten up. Uh, it's hormonal. And uh, the main mechanism in, in animals, it's reward mechanism. So when you do something biologically correct, you feel reward, you feel good. There is a hormone called dopamine and some other chemicals being released and you feel great, you feel high motivation for life, you feel happy, you feel uh, high level of satisfaction. And then where there is no reward, when you do something uh, which is not biologically correct, you feel lower uh, pleasure, you feel a lack of motivation, and you feel depressed. And uh, in clinical terms, when it's called uh, dopamine shortage, and when if you really depleted from dopamine, we diagnose uh, chronic uh, clinic depression. And, and it goes further, and then you get Parkinson's disease. So it's, it's uh, physiological, it's not psychological, all these things. And uh, the problem is that not all the situations in our modern world are uh, natural. So take the example with the moth. Uh, the moth goes to the light bulb and heating it and falls down and gets up, going toward the light again and falls down and this is how they die <laughs> nowadays. Uh, and when we lived in Uganda, these huge lights was there, and then you go in the morning, and under these lights, there is this much insects, dead insects there. Why is it happening? Why do our signals confuse them so much? Why do you think it's happening? Any guesses? Instinct. Hmm? Instinct. Yes, it's instinct, and they can't go against it. But why? It is not natural to go towards the light bulbs. Why can't they just fly by? You Feeling. Know? Hmm? Feeling. Feeling, yes. So the thing is with the moth, it's a nocturnal animal. It's supposed to fly towards the moonlight and starlight and maybe reflected off the water lights of these objects. And this is the natural situation he's been involved in for millions of years. And uh, it wasn't any light bulbs around. This is a situation artificially created by human activity. So his instincts tell him, go towards the light. That's, that's the way to go. And he goes. And he hits it, he falls down because he doesn't have a, a, such an advanced brains as we do. He doesn't have a, such a long memory. He does it again and again and again till he dies. And uh, this is what is happening with this a mechanism of behavior control when the situation goes out of normal natural situation. And uh, I want you to remember this example because we will come back to it many times. So, for the humans, coming back to diet, uh, the natural situation, uh, it's a bit different to what we have at the moment. At the moment, our situation is very, very altered by our own activity. So the natural situation, we are part of the great apes, hominids, uh, primates, and uh, all of them, all of our um, presently alive uh, cousins from this family, they all eat this kind of diet. They eat uh, based on fruit or vegetation or both combined. Uh, with some flowers, with some occasional nuts, occasional roots, insects, some little things they can supplement here and there, and sometimes they can even supplement some fish, but it's not, it is just by chance for some population. But normally, this is what they eat. And normally, uh, for us, for our physiology, this is what we can digest without any problems. And this is also what we are naturally supposed to be attracted to. So, uh, in humans, uh, coming back to this morph example, we, our brain is a bit more complicated than his neurological system. So, we have um, uh, this, recently oh, yeah. this recently developed part of the brain which is called front, prefrontal cortex. And these frontal lobes of the brain is the bit which we developed uh, the latest in our evolution. 
And this limbic system, which is reptilian brain, this is this mechanism which controls our uh, emotions, uh, immediate response to the situation, like fear, reward, arousal, pleasure, and also through this, we can hear needs of our body. For example, if you're deficient in something, or you're hungry, you feel this through this part of the brain, limbic system. And uh, also, if there is any confused signals uh, due to artificial situations, they also come through this limbic system. Uh, there is also some social influences. We are social creature, and so we are affected by leadership and by groups. So when you are inside some kind of group, you will see that you, your behavior is affected by this group. And these signals also coming through, through the limbic system. And so, but this part of the brain, which we are recently developed, have ability to overcome these signals. Because at some point of our evolution, I suppose it was some serious challenges, we had to overcome uh, these signals in order to overcome challenging situations. So situation was hard, so we couldn't eat anything. We had to starve ourselves. We have to not starve, but uh, had to go hungry for some time. And in this case, limbic systems say, conserve the energy. Don't go anywhere. Sit down. Like, don't spend much energy. And the prefrontal cortex tells, no, go and find food. You want to survive in the long term. Not right now, but in the long term. So we develop this part of the brain. And this is what makes us human. And this is our um, conscious self-control, logical reasoning, long term safety, and long term goals. And things like uh, environmental being environmentally aware. This is here. Care about your health long term. This is here. Make a good decisions for your health. This is also here. And here, it will be decisions for eat the chocolate cake right now. <laughs> this is here. This is this part of the brain which make you behave more like a moth rather than a human being. And I want you to remember this bit because this is what makes us human. And without this bit, uh, abstract concepts and logical reasoning and uh, conscious self-control, we can't be human, really. Uh, this is what makes us free from the situations which pushes us all over the place. Okay. Coming back to our mechanisms, how we supposed to pick our food, how we supposed to do it naturally, we arrive to five main tastes. So who knows the first one? Sweet. Sweet? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Why? Why do you think it is? Uh, if you look back on uh, this slide, why do you think we develop the sweet taste? And it's one of the main important tastes for us. Why did we develop it? Sugar. Sugar for brain? Freeze. Uh, yes. So brain, you, you correctly noticed that our brain runs on what fuel? Glucose. glucose. Glucose, correct. And glucose is a simple sugar. And uh, primates, uh, especially hominids, we developed uh, taking our calories for 99.5. 9% of our evolution on a fruit diet, and all, all scientists agree with this. So for a very long period of our evolution, it was a fruit diet which was uh, uh, heavily uh, relying on fruits. And fruits are high in calories, it's, it's a simple carbohydrate, so we developed this taste for sugar. And uh, when in your life you want sweet stuff the most? Uh, we at which, which age? How do you think? Yeah. yeah. So what kids like? They like sweets. <laughs> they are very attracted to sweets. Why? Because they are growing. Their brain is growing. <coughs> they need simple sugars to run it. And uh, however, because they don't have access to fruit, or because their culture is different, they get it from other places, like sweets or like. Uh, 
starch, mm -hmm. it's still it's still a glucose, so it works for some time. Okay, second taste. Uh, second is sour. Why do you think sour is important to us? What do we what do we suppose? So the sweet is uh, down to calories. We recognize how much calorie uh, from simple sugars is there. That's what we we can taste. And uh, the sweeter the apple is, the more calorie it has, and we can sense it. We can sense it. So the it's a little bit sweeter. It's 10 calories more than a green one, but we can taste it. And we, if we are hungry, we'll find this one. The red one is more tasty than the green one. So the sour, why do you think the sour? Alkalizing? Uh, no. So the sour, uh, do you know a particular vitamin which tastes like sour? C. Yes, vitamin C. And uh, do you know what's going to happen to a human being if we don't take any vitamin C for some time with our food? Scurvy. Scurvy, exactly. And how long do you think it takes to develop scurvy? A couple of weeks. Not a couple of weeks, but maybe a couple of months or three months without any vitamin C. And uh, you can learn it from the history when uh, explorers was going on a long expedition on the ships. Uh, half of them wasn't coming back, and this, it was a huge problem. The uh, amount of uh, sailors died from scurvy was more than the amount of sailors died in all the wars combined at that time. It was millions. So. Uh, it's very important. We can't survive without vitamin C. However, do you know that cats, they can because they produce their own vitamin C and we don't. But we lost, we could at some point in our evolution, our ancestors could produce it. It was way down the line when we wasn't human uh, homo sapiens yet. But uh, this gene went dormant because uh, it was so much vitamin C coming from the diet that we lost the ability to produce it. And the same thing happens to guinea pigs, same thing happened to uh, other, some kind of birds, and our cousin, like chimpanzees and gorillas, they all don't produce their own vitamin C, they rely on the diet because it's supposed to come from it. So you know how kids, they often like, chew on something so if you just let them run in the garden they will like pick something and, and <laughs> eat some uh, new pine shoots which are very sour that's what they're craving for vitamin c and nowadays many kids could be deficient in it because of artificial diets okay next one is the salty flavor and uh, why do you think this we have these salty receptors what they to taste salt what do we supposed to taste with it mm -hmm. hmm? Any guesses? Okay, so the salt uh, which we eat, it's a mineral. But it's not the only mineral in our environment. It's a lot of minerals we're supposed to taste with these receptors. And minerals are extremely important for us. We build our body uh, with uh, some percentage of minerals in it. And we need minerals for almost every reaction in the body. So, uh, if you stay away from salt for a couple months or three months, you'll start to notice that tomato, for example, uh, tastes saltier than orange. Do you notice it? Or celery tastes saltier than the cucumber. This is amount of minerals with this receptor you can identify. And this is important to us. When you in the nature, when you become deficient in some mineral, you will go around and look uh, for some plant and taste everything and see whichever tastes the best and you eat it and you'll get minerals from there. And this is what cats do, you know, how they eat the grass. They, they're not the grass eaters, but they eat the grass sometimes because there is something which they need. And how do they know it? They didn't uh, read it, you know, somewhere, or they just feel, it, it feels good to do, feels, feels tasty for now. And as soon as you um, satisfy this deficiency, this taste will go away. So all these tastes, they are not 
It's not permanent. As soon as you add enough, suddenly food doesn't taste as good. You're full. You don't want to eat anymore. And, uh, okay, bitter taste. Why do we have a bitter receptors here on the back of your tongue? How do you think what is uh, designed for? <laughs> Why did we evolve it? Is it for dangerous foods? This is very good, yes, yes. So bitter usually has something to do with our safety. So you go in the wild, you taste the berries, and there is some berries are bitter, and this usually identifies that it's poisonous to some extent, and it's just not edible for you. And most of not edible plants are bitter or not pleasant, or they are too spicy or something like this. However, we learn to use this uh, receptor to stimulate it with uh, spices like chili in some uh, small amounts we can tolerate it and then even some countries can push it a bit further with how much they can tolerate it <laughs> and really enjoy it because stimulating all these senses uh, gives the signal to your brain to the pleasure center and then you feel pleasure you can stimulate it you can stimulate it more you can stimulate it less if you stimulate it more then it feels more pleasant and uh, we, we are quite good at creating substances which will stimulate your pleasure center. And heroin is, you know, the best example of it. We really stimulate this uh, pleasure, uh, uh, pleasure center. Uh, so the fifth taste, do you know how it's called? Umami. Umami, yes. And how does it, how does it feel? What, what is it? Can you meaty. describe it? It's like meaty. Meaty, yes, exactly. And why exactly it's meaty? There is a simple explanation. And here where we go to our vegan theme of all this event, why people find it so hard to get off the animal products. It's this receptor, because it also could be stimulated and you can get addicted to this stimulation. So, how does it work? Uh, umami receptor actually uh, reacts not on amount of protein, but it reacts on glutamates. Glutamate, uh, glutamate amino acid is one of the most abundant amino acids in nature. It's pretty much in every uh, plant and um, uh, animal everywhere. It's uh, one of the um, building block for all the common proteins. So when we bite a tomato, we bite into it and we can sense glutamate. And the amount of glutamates in tomato is much higher than in orange, for example. And this, for us, indicates there is more protein in this food than in the orange. So therefore, if your body can do with more protein, you'll choose tomatoes over the, <laughs> over the uh, orange, for example. Also, other foods which are high in it is asparagus, broccoli, um, uh, beans and peas, and then onions, and then seaweed very much, sea vegetables, and then all the root vegetables like beets, and then mushrooms, and, uh, and then animal products as well. But the thing is with animal products, uh, when you cook it, then it stimulates this receptor much more. Why? Because the protein in the animal product breaks down, and then so there is more free glutamates running around, and you can taste it. And so if you smoke the salmon, it will taste to you more pleasant than a fresh salmon, just from, you know, like the way the bear eats it. <laughs> and if you try to eat uh, so basically all these tastes, they've been evolved uh, in interaction with uh, natural food in its natural state. So if you try to choose between um, raw salmon and banana and lemon and uh, uh, chili, you will quickly find what suits you better, you know. Uh, in the beginning of our uh, raw food uh, journey, we tried to eat um, raw fish for some time, but we quickly gone off it because it, it doesn't 
taste that great and it's not that attractive and we didn't really feel like we need it so we quickly it just went off we didn't try to restrict it or anything it just went off the diet because uh, we lost interest and and this is what will happen if you don't cook it if you don't salt it if you don't spice it if you don't make it into a nice um, a dish which will stimulate all these receptors at once and then it's a great product which is very easy to sell because it stimulates it. So, um, we even created artificial uh, glutamates and now on the Asian market is uh, very big and uh, they sell it, it's been developed in the beginning of 20th century uh, is Japanese professor who worked on it and patented it and now they put it in pretty much every um, uh, soup and every uh, animal product to intensify stimulation of this receptor. It doesn't mean there's more protein there, it's just more stimulating just like we add salt to stimulate receptor and feel more pleasure out of food. And uh, uh, the thing is with animal products People don't understand that a, they are also stimulating and the more processed they are, the more addictive they get because they stimulate this receptor. And this is why we make these choices and this is why it's so hard for many people to get off bacon. Okay. Next one. Uh, there is a couple more elements to successful uh, modern food products and one of them oh, sorry, called fat and we can also detect with our tongue amount of fat in a product and why do you think uh, fat is important for us? Why do we care altogether? Because it's an essential fatty acid. Essential fatty acids. Well, um, not maybe when we take it in such a quantity as we do in modern life it's not that essential anymore but the thing is with fat we was evolving in a situation where it was always short shortage of calories till the maybe last 50 years in our evolution it was always some kind of shortage people had problems put on weight people had problems getting enough calories so we are um, especially, you know, in the regions where the winter could be coming, fat became very important because we want to protect our body from the environment uh, to put on some fat layer. And it's, it's um, easier to do if you consume something which has fat in it. And things like nuts and seeds, they are seasonal stuff usually in the end of the year. You eat them before the winter and then you can survive for the winter and then by the spring you are very, very thin and then you start to refeed again properly on all the green and, and fresh stuff and, and it would all work out. Uh, and our environment would limit us into amount of calories which we could eat. And uh, at the moment our environment doesn't limit us anymore. We don't have shortage. And this is really for the maybe first time in human history, as long as uh, the modern history goes so uh, amount of fat we can detect with our tongue and it makes food a little bit more attractive to a certain point like we still don't enjoy just drinking oil because uh, our body rejects it it cannot take too high fat content and the higher fat content the more consequences for your long-term health you have and that's scientifically proven uh, but it still could taste good and the other thing is accessibility so the quicker, the easier the option is you can get, the more likely you choose this. So the modern food industry uses all these things combined and comes up with the successful products. And uh, the thing is, coming back to our brain, uh, if you yeah, look at this slide, so this part of the brain, a prefrontal cortex, develops uh, a long time, a very long time. So for the kids, uh, three or five years old kid, he doesn't have more of a frontal cortex than the chimpanzee. And this is part of the brain which can 
overcome these signals. So for kids, in natural situation, just like a chimpanzee, the kid in natural situation from more or less natural foods, he will choose these foods. He will not run after the rabbit and kill it and eat it, you know, half alive, like, like lion would do, lion cub. And the same with chimpanzee, they wouldn't go after the rabbit. They will take this if they have the opportunity. <clears throat> However, in a natural situation, kids very easily fall for stimulated things. And the easiest to stimulate is you put some sugar into some water and this is very stimulating for the kids' tongue because the sweet taste they very want. And then you put all the other tastes together combined and this is successful product, pizza. And then you put fat and, and sweet together and this is successful dessert. And this is what kids will choose in a natural situation and this is what Chimpanzee will also choose in a natural situation. And so all the kids' menus, they based usually on things like this, because it's easier to persuade kids to eat it. OK, so uh, coming back to our mechanism, just a few examples. Uh, Artificial environment and artificial foods <coughs> gives confused signals to our brains. So we make poor food choices and we get disease. And this is what we can see on a large scale and the best country to illustrate it probably will be United States as the, they have the biggest health crisis and the biggest fast food industry. And uh, they have the biggest amount of stimulating food being sold and being consumed per capita. So, as, and the modern disease like cancer, heart disease and diabetes, they go up dramatically there. So, uh, how can we deal with it? What we need to do, we need to remember, we are not this moth. We have the other part of the brain to make intelligent choices. We need to remember that we don't have to act on our feelings. The problem is that people do not understand that their feelings can be a confused, confused signals from the brain. They think the feelings are very important. You know, I feel like eating this chocolate cake. I just, like it's emotional, spiritual, whatever. This is how I feel. But you don't have to act on it. And as soon as you explain person, this is what's going on with you, that this signal is just getting confused, they suddenly feel power to overcome it. So take a simple situations. For example, cold. You know, we are tropical creatures. We still live in tropic, you know, in, you know, in tropical environment. We uh, carry it with ourselves with our clothing, with our uh, heating, with our homes. We, we didn't move out of tropics yet. We, di we didn't adapt to it yet. We didn't develop sufficient hairs. So uh, as soon as the temperature goes down and the temperature of your body goes down, you will start to feel hunger and cravings but not just for anything. You wouldn't want to eat spinach, for example, in particular, but you would like to eat something prettier, something more concentrated, something, you know, sufficient, something mm, comfort food, you know, comfort food for the winter foods. It's something which is very concentrated, which is uh, uh, high in calories, and uh, there is usually some fat in it. And so if we expose ourselves to cold environments and don't warm ourselves, so we can live in a cold climate, like I'm from Siberia, but you can uh, make yourself pretty warm and comfortable all the time, and then you wouldn't put on as much weight as if you live in a situation where, for example, you don't have a central heating and uh, to heat your house is expensive, so you keep it under 19 degrees, and then you will put on some fat 
inevitably because you will feel like eating more fattier concentrated foods which make you put on weight easier and when it comes to animal products they are high in fat so in the past especially when it wasn't that much vegan options it was the easiest thing for people to do in the colder <coughs> climates and if you look at the map where is the animal products consumed, consumed the most if you go to the north and people there primarily live on the animal products because that's the easiest way to to go along with this mechanism so same thing with the low physical activity and this is actually very interesting because it's metabolic it is nothing to do with your psychology but if you just uh, move less you will see that you put on fat and not because uh, you just not move enough but because you eat more you will feel more hunger and more cravings and it will be cravings for fatty and more concentrated foods and as I am as a nutritionist I work with people as soon as you get them on the exercise regimen they suddenly see their hunger went down they exercise more they spend more but they eat less they cannot understand this how does it work and it works because of particular hormones uh, because we have two states of metabolism acquiring calories and spending them just like bear here he collecting the calories in the summer and then spending it in the winter and the same to us we can collect and we can spend but for many people spending never happens only collecting happens and uh, as and there is a hormones like insulin which are dedicated to this particular uh, state of metabolism and if you uh, spend uh, not exercising enough time in your life you will see that you will want to exercise even less and you will want to eat even more as soon as you adapt a regimen of regular exercise and you'll see your hunger will go down so the yellow things is a stress and unpleasant situations and isolation isolation for human being as a social creature is not normal it's considered by our brains as a stressful situation because if you are in the forest on your own what could happen you're probably not going to survive as well as you would have been in a group and the reason why we are survived so well and did so good on this planet because we are uh, working the most effective we are in groups in societies in cultures in tribes and families we work together as a team and we are much more effective in everything just try you know for yourself to for five years live on your own and you'll see you're not that effective and also you're not that happy you're gonna feel uh, more stressed and more depressed and uh, when you feel stress uh, because we was evolved in a situation when there was a shortage of calories when every challenging situation was coming your body reacts like okay put on uh, some fat because you know hard times we might not survive we need some resources just in case okay so easy solution if you are finding yourself getting fat in a cold climate like in this uh, uh, in UK warm up so go to sauna drink some hot water dress up move keep yourself moving and uh, maybe turn on heating or isolate uh, insulate your house and you'll see your hunger will go down and your cravings for the fat things will go down it's very easy and is surprisingly effective okay uh, for low physical activity just uh, regular exercise make sure that you do it you know involve yourself in a situation where you have to do it then you'll see your life will change and your body shape will change not because you spend it but because you eat less a little bit spending too uh, and then to to not eat how people say emotionally but really it's more hormonal in situations of stress isolation and unpleasant situations be more social more socially active have a big teams around you big teams of friends you'll see you'll not go into binging you'll not go into this uh, uh, behaviors when you eat and eat this is just example of me uh, this is last year uh, after 
six months in UK and it was we lived in an environment where it was quite cold. And this is two months after, in a hot environment. It, body lost the fat quite quickly and this is eight kilos difference. So yeah, if you just, you know, make sure you're not not cold, you'll lose the extra weight. Uh, there is a se several situations when people will start to <coughs> eat things they would normally eat. So this, this situation here, it's on this run, which I was talking about, uh, 700 kilometers around Black Sea. And uh, the thing is, we was doing it uh, every day, running from, like, the longest day we ran, it was 42 kilometers, the shortest probably, like, 10 or something. Maybe one or two days we had the days off when we was recovering, but mostly we was moving all the time. So I depleted myself from pretty much all the fat. I mean, as a woman, you're supposed to keep some fat layer on yourself, and then you go below it, then your body starts to see, send you signals of depletion. And if you bring just anyone, just I will take anyone from you and run him for like one month intensely, <laughs> and he will deplete himself in fat reserves, and then he will experience something he never experienced before, severe hunger. It's hunger when you just you look in the, in the rubbish bins, you like you look at someone else's plate, you don't care about animals, you don't care about anything anymore. Like, you just lose it. And if you bring yourself to this state, then uh, you, will, you will be likely going off the vegan diet, or off any diet whatsoever. And because many uh, athletes who excel themselves often bring themselves to this state, they find it hard to stick to a particular diet because they just don't care at that moment, because uh, the Olympic system works so intensely, it just tells them, you eat right now, or you're gonna die, because you know, in the situation of the forest, if you deplete yourself, you might not make it for the next month. And it was, you know, life-threatening. In our situation, Limbic system is the ancient part of the brain. It doesn't care that you're gonna eat in five hours your nice vegan meal, it still tells you, eat right now whatever you find right here on the floor. It's okay. <laughs> it's not that intelligent part of the brain. The intelligent one, you have to access consciously. You have to stop yourself from going right now in this McDonald's and just, you, you know, it's okay. We'll get home. We will make our nice food. We will eat as much calories as we need and we will, we will fix this depletion. And if people know that this is how it works, uh, they're able to make these conscious decisions. But if they don't know, uh, you know, like online, I don't know if uh, many of you followed, um, any vegans who went off the vegan diet. And many of them did it after a long fast. And what happens in a long fast is depletion. And it's not only depletion of calories, sometimes you deplete or uh, depletion of proteins, not to the point you're going to die, but just a little bit less than your normal, your, your usual. And then your body says, okay, maybe you can do with more protein. And when it says you, you can do with more protein, what it does, yeah, it brings you to this uh, food receptor, uh, this uh, taste receptor. So you will go for the food which tastes like this. It tastes like glutamate. You will look for, uh, people say, I want a protein taste. I want animal product. Your brain, the way it works, it goes into your uh, previous life experience and sees in which situations you had the most stimulation of this taste receptor. And it's probably happened when you add like uh, eggs or fish or meat or bacon or something like this. So it will go to this memory and bring it out of there and say, okay, this is what we need. But it doesn't mean that it's the best uh, thing to do for your health. It's a limbic system. It's not concern of your long-term health. It's only concern of your survival right now. 
It also doesn't know that, uh, for example, bacon doesn't have uh, as much good protein for you as, uh, you know, like uh, lots of asparagus and vegetables and uh, beans and uh, peas. It doesn't know this. Your frontal cortex <coughs> might do if you studied it. Uh, so it will give you whatever <coughs> just seem to be like uh, mimicking this taste. Same thing like if child wants some sweet taste, he not necessarily will ask for apple, he will ask for whatever sweet he remembers. This is his limbic system. He doesn't even participate in the conscious choice. And most of people still live in this condition like kids not knowing how their brain works. And if they would know that, okay, if you have a little bit, um, went a little bit low on protein and your body will ask you for cooked eggs because it has a lot of glutamates in it because it's a broken protein, uh, if you would know all this, you would say, okay, buddy, if you really think the egg is what you want, you try a raw egg and see how you feel. And most of people would feel like, no, I don't want to, I don't want to get salmonella <laughs> and, and not go for it. They would just go for, you know, these sources. Okay. Yes, so fasting, uh, that increased physical activity and then breaking down of your body protein can lead you to animal food cravings. And there is a story uh, which uh, I encountered with one little uh, boy. He had a, a blood cancer and he was going through a chemotherapy. And the chemotherapy is very, very impactful on, on your body and it breaks your own protein and it breaks your own tissue and it, it's extremely extremely harmful and so what he felt uh, during this chemotherapy he was asking for the sausages all the time he said i'm not gonna eat anything only sausages bring me sausages mom and nothing else and sausages is is the food uh, which stimulates this umami receptor one of the most because it's the most bro broken down animal product and they often put uh, artificial glutamate in it to stimulate this receptor even more. And then a little bit of salt and some fat stimulates it even more. And then his brain was going, uh, the protein was breaking down in his body and his brain was going and signaling, okay, we can do with more protein. And then in his brain, it was going down to the uh, situation where he was getting the most of this umami taste, and this was sausages, so it was given this uh, order, only sausages. And four years old child, he can't make intelligent decisions for himself if he is exposed to these artificial sources of food. Uh, so his parents was just feeding him sausages. Well, luckily he survived and everything is, uh, went well. So solution. In this situation, if you have animal food cravings, stem vegetables, greens, peas, beans, corns, vegetables, seaweed. Seaweed is the place where they uh, discovered they can extract this glutamate so they can sell it as a salt. They was extracting it from the seaweed stock. So if you have some animal cravings, uh, maybe even consider supplement uh, plant protein you know, and uh, use all these things. And seaweed is just, will be very satisfying to your taste, but if you want to satisfy it. Um, the thing is, this is the slide I was going to show you about this 700 kilometer run. Uh, what we did in this run, because we was moving so much and we was doing it on a raw food diet, it was mostly fruit because, well, first of all, it was lots of free fruit around because it was south and it was growing all over the place and people was giving us, we was hardly spending anything all on food. However, uh, it, we would eat like, it wasn't good, like it wasn't even any question of cooking or anything like this. We didn't even have like any means to us with us. Uh, so we would eat some vegetables here and there but hard vegetables like broccoli and carrot and cabbage, if you run with it, you'll feel it's not that comfortable. 
So we was mostly avoiding it for one and a half months. And then by the end of this trip, I came back and I felt I want to eat cooked eggs for the first time of my vegan life. And I, I understood very clearly that something wrong here and uh, I'm not going to do it because what's the point? I am vegan and I, I know very well from science that there is nothing there which is essential for me. So I start to study all this stuff and that's uh, what I learned. Um, the other thing, when you get some mineral deficiencies, uh, you get all sorts of weird cravings, like some people eat garlic and just eat and eat and eat, and onions and some other things, like it could be weird stuff coming up. Um, and they also feel lack of satiation. Like you eat and eat and eat, you're already full, but there is no satiation. There is something missing. And this is happening when you have a mineral deficiency. And um, so what to do in this case? Leafy greens, lots of minerals in there, organic vegetables, because, uh, you know, supermarket produce often grew in a poor soil, and you just, the soil is deficient of this mineral, you can't get it from this vegetable. So it, it's the best thing, of course, is to grow it yourself or get it from organic um, farm or someone you know who grow it himself. And maybe consider some supplements, do some tests. Go to doctor, test your blood and see if you're deficient in something. And in our artificial world, we can easily get deficient uh, on the vegan diet on, or on the normal diet. And most of people are deficient in some this or that, some mineral or vitamin or something. And the best way is to eat real food as much as possible of the real stuff. You know, this is my mom. She lives in Siberia and she grows all this stuff. You see these huge cabbages she grows. And this uh, uh, is called Jerusalem artichokes. They are very, very good for you and have a lot of good uh, nutrients. And this is cucumbers they grow. And they grow and they keep uh, much of it for the most of the year. And my mom, she doesn't <coughs> have these things with mineral deficiencies or lack of satiation or anything because she eats real food all the time, pretty much through, throughout the whole year. And, you know, the summer in Siberia is like three months at the most compared to here, compared to Europe. It's, it's much more challenging, but it's possible. And uh, she collects the berries wild berries and she grows a lot of berries and lots of greens and wild greens and she puts it in the freezer and keeps it and then makes a smoothies from it and eats it in various forms and uh, she also grows her own wheatgrass just like this in containers very easy just uh, put wheat, uh, wheat um, seeds in a little bit of soil water it in seven days you're gonna have a wheatgrass and then you you cut it and put it in your green smoothies. And this is a lot of minerals and nutrients, which in the winter could be hard to get in a, in a Siberian climate. And this is wild strawberries, actually. Extremely tasty. So maybe the tastiest food I ever <coughs> tasted in my life. You, you put it in your mouth and it's like explosion of taste. Why it's explosion? Because all my uh, taste buds reacting on it. There is so much nutrients. There is minerals, there is vitamins, there is this and that, and there is also some calories. And it's just so satiating. And when I go and live there with my mom for some time, I eat so much less in volume and get satiated much quicker than when I come back to UK and eat here. And, and this is down to nutrients. We don't really need that much calories, but we need nutrient-dense food. Uh, so, uh, one little thing what I want to mention on the vegan diet. So, this is system, limbic system, it sends you signals which you get involuntarily. So, you want it or not, you're going to get it. And uh, the uh, level of strength of the signal depends on your neurological system. So, if, for example, you sedated with something, you take, take sedative... Uh, sedative uh, medicine, or you take a lot of alcohol, you will not feel much of these uh, signals. 
but if you don't take anything sedative and if your diet is very clean, you become very sensitive. So the natural uh, vegan diet, they will shift this balance towards this, not because this one becomes weaker, no, but because these signals become stronger and you need to know it. And uh, how people experience it, they experience it how, uh, like their sensitivity is more, sensitivity to food, sensitivity to everything around them, to emotions, to uh, how my husband was talking about this ability to push yourself, like your body, uh, your self-preservation signals become stronger. Not to stop you from achieving stuff, but to protect you from hurting yourself. And it doesn't mean that it's anything bad, extra sensitivity, it's extra capability where you can use it. What you need to do is to strengthen this bit, exercise a little bit more of conscious control, a little bit more of logical reasoning, and maybe study a little bit more about your diet so you would know exactly what is good for you and what is not. So you'll find the easier time to make a better choices. And, uh, the reason why we know it, that it's something to do with neurological uh, system, it's uh, the history, almost 100 years old history of treating kids with epilepsy and seizures uh, with a keto diet. Do you know what keto diet is? Yeah. It's uh, high in animal fat and high in animal products. What it does to, to uh, uh, over Re overactive neurological system of an epileptic kid, it sedates it, it like, like calms it. And it does the same thing as a sedative medicine. So the kids can go on this diet and they, they get off the medication. And it's very effective and we use it for about 100 years in medicine. And uh, this, it developed out of uh, first experiments with fasting because fasting uh, you use your ketones uh, for producing uh, power for your neurological system and brain and ketones slow you down compared to glucose. Glucose make you fire you up. It makes uh, your neurological system go <coughs> alive. So epileptic kids, they, they benefit from this diet, but this is how we know that it's sedated. So uh, unnatural diets and, and diets uh, heavy and animal products they will make these signals weaker. So it might be easier to use that one, but it doesn't mean that it's a good thing for you. It means that uh, you just can't hear them as good. That's all. That's why, why many vegans find it that they are becoming so sensitive on this diet. They react on everything. They feel everything. They become more spiritual. Like that's just a metaphor, met metaphor for, for this feeling. But it's just something to do with neurological system. Yes. Uh, just remember, you know, we are primates. That's what we're supposed to do. And uh, do as good as you can in your situation. You know, like, uh, it, it is nothing perfect in our life. We, we do as good as we're ready to do for now. And uh, just look at these things. This does not look attractive. It's very attractive. Like we could see so much color, so much vibrancy, and uh, the closer you can get to it, the better it will be for you. And uh, just remember, you know, we, we're doing stuff to our planet. And uh, in, in the previous century, we eliminated, um, not we, but uh, 500 species went extinct. And uh, 700, oh, 477 of them went extinct because of our actions, our actions as a humans. And uh, some of them we killed, some of them just uh, couldn't adapt to our pollution, you know, like bees are dying in UK because of our pollution and our activity. Uh, so please remember this and it will help you to make better choices for yourself. So. Five simple, simple advices. Eat more real food to be successful on the vegan diet. Supplement if needed. Check yourself. <coughs> See how you do it. It's artificial situation. We don't live in a forest. We could get deficient sometimes. And 
uh, animal litters also get deficient, so please check yourself. And then be active, exercise, this will help you. You cannot achieve optimum health without any exercise. It doesn't have to be a gym, like going to gym or lifting weight. Just stay active, do something, use your body. And then remember what is the natural diet for our species. Remember this, so no one can push you off, off the balance, you know, off your um, understanding what it is. And then consider the impact of your choices. When you're thinking in a, in a store what to buy, imagine, like, just remember where this food comes from, who died for it. Or maybe no one died for it, but it's just been, uh, you know, uh, driven from around the world, from the other part of the world, and then maybe you'll do with the local organic produce much better. So, that's all. Thank you very much. Remember, you are not the moth. Be more intelligent. <laughs>